All right. Well, welcome back. Uh, excited to be here. Uh, I really am. I think this is an important conversation, and uh, and I like being around high schoolers, middle schoolers. I actually just went to a high school basketball game last night. Watched Shamanad versus Trinity. Shamanad won. In case any of you are wondering, um, it's a very good game. I uh, hope all of your teams are doing well. I've uh, been looking at the box scores. I'm trying to see Melville. We have Melville in the room. They have a pretty good, they have a solid team this year. I think Oakville's going to upset them in the district. I um, think it's going to be really good. Um, anyways, uh, it's a very important conversation. We're talking about our phone. Uh, how many of you guys have a phone? Okay, that right there would say maybe you should lean in over the next few moments. And kind of just a few, a, a few words of review. We started out last week by saying this, your phone can be used for a lot of good. Your phone can be used for good. I think humanity has been using technology to make an impact for the glory of God for hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of years. I do. I think it could be used for a lot of good. We're going to talk about that some next week, not so much tonight. Uh, because here's the reality. Your phone can also be used for a lot of harm. Your phone could be used for a lot of harm. And I think that it could be dangerous. I think that, that we have to be really, really careful. Um, I think that, honestly, uh, if, we're being, if we're being real, if we just kind of go with the flow, if we're like, ah, I don't really have a plan or intentionality, I think it could be used for a lot of harm. I think it could harm your soul. I think it could harm your emotional life, your spiritual life, your relationship with people, and most importantly, your relationship with God. If we could keep those up there, that's perfect. So I want to ask the question, um, and we kind of started out with this question, and I think it's important for all of us to wrestle with, and it's this. Do you control your phone, or does your phone control you, right? Right? Like, do you, have, do you have a sense of control on your phone? I guess maybe a better question. Do you have a plan? Do you have a plan of action? Do you have a purpose? Is there any meaning when you get on your phone? Do you have like limits? Do you have different things? Have you even had the conversation about how maybe we could use our phone for a lot of good? Or, or does your phone just kind of honestly control you? Are you a slave to your phone? Do you uncontrollably just like search and scroll and Snapchat and all this without, any, without thinking about it at all? Do you just go with the flow? Because if you do, I think it's going to be used for a lot of harm. Or, or at the very best, let's just acknowledge right now, we're, we're in some danger. We're in a danger zone, right? If there's no plan of attack... Maybe there are some dangers that would go along with it. And so last week we talked about a couple of them. We said this, our phones cause us to be disconnected when we are to be connecting with the world. But our phones also cause us to be distracted by the world when we are, when we are to be disconnecting from the world. So really it's kind of a double-edged sword. We talked about it last week. Like you have a God-given desire for community, to be connected with people, to have good, solid friendships, face-to-face -face friendships. But let's be real, at times this gets in the way. At times, this gets in the way. Hanging out with your family in the living room, hanging out with friends. We gave some stories where it's like friends, people who love each other are in the same room for multiple minutes, and you don't say hi. We acknowledge that maybe, just maybe, this can cause us to be disconnected from the world that God says, hey, maybe you should be connecting with relationally. It's good for our soul, and this gets in the way. And then we said that our soul also desires to just be with God to find some solitude, to isolate ourselves from just the craziness and the noise. But when we get alone and we try and pray or read our Bible, let's be real, this can get in the way. This is looming. This is attractive. This is enticing. This is tempting. And oftentimes it hurts both of those things. And these are God-given desires. These are good desires you have to be, to, to, to be alone with God to be connected with people. But we said that if you search out your God-given desires, any of them through this, your desires will always be unfulfilled. Your desires aren't the issue. It's how you go about fulfilling them. And I think oftentimes this, this is what we look to and it just never, ever, ever satisfies. And so today we're gonna talk about two other desires that I think God has planted on our hearts and in our minds to actually have be brought forth in our world and the way that we live our lives day to day and how maybe just maybe these desires are forfeited on the altar of our phones. And the first one is this, confidence. Confidence. 
I believe you have a God-given desire to be confident, to be secure, to be rooted in who you are. Jesus follower, hear me. You are loved. You are cherished. You are valued. You are worth more than you could ever possibly imagine. You are loved. You are cared for. You are valued. You are cherished. You are loved more than you could ever possibly imagine. And, and, and that's, been, that's been spoken over your life the moment that you believe that Jesus is who he says he is. And even if you don't, you have extraordinary intrinsic value that God has given to you because you are made in his image. And so Jesus follower, I would make a case, even if you weren't a Jesus follower, you desire so badly for that to be enough. Wow. God loves me. I'm valued. I'm cherished. That's enough. You desire, you desire so bad, so bad to be able to say, I'm secure in who I am. I am confident in who I am. I find, I find my approval and my worth from the God who says, I approve of you. You're accepted and approved. But for many of us, we look for our approval from people through this. Y'all know this is true. For many of us, there's this God-given desire to be confident, to be rooted, to, have, to, to be confident in our approval, and we search for it in this. We do. But, but does that ever work? Does this build confidence? I don't know. Let's think about it for a few moments together. There's a story as I was looking at this this week and thinking about this of a 19-year-old girl who throughout high school, she had tried building up this reputation on social media, 19-year-old girl. She, find, she found herself with over 500,000 followers by the time she was 19. She was insta-famous, okay? Her name was As- Asina O'Neill, I believe was her name. And, and as she was talking about this, as she was talking about her, and let's be real, some of you would be like, that'd be pretty cool, having 500,000 followers. I'm sure she'd get a lot of likes, right? And so look at what she says. This is kind of how she talks about her rise, you know, in fame on social media. She said this, over-sexualization, perfect food photos, perfect travel vlogs. It is textbook how I got famous. So this is how it took place. She took pictures, I'm sure, of her body and different things. And then she posted great pictures and she acted like she traveled all over the world or maybe she did. And so she got famous. But was this, was this enough? Did this satisfy She goes on to say this, everyone goes through life differently. Myself, growing up with social comparing so easily available, it consumed me. I spent ages 12 to 16, think how sad this is, wishing I was someone else. Then I spent 16 to 19 constantly molding myself, editing myself, think about that, and self-promoting the best parts of my life, which turned into a massive career based on social approval and how I looked aesthetically. No, it didn't build confidence. She just said that she wanted to be somebody else for most of her adolescent life. And then she said, like even after she made it, even after she thought, okay, maybe this is on, she was still editing herself. She was putting on a front so that maybe she could be approved of. And let's be real, she kind of had it. 500,000 followers. Ain't none of you got 500,000 followers, right? I got 300. Like, that's a lot of followers. <laughs> she went on to say this. I simply no longer want to compare my life to someone else's edited highlights. I want to put all those hours I looked into a screen into my real life goals, personal relationships, and aspirations. I'm over this celebrity culture and obsession. It's silly and for the most part, internally lonely, fake. And then she said this, and I think this is a paradox that many of us are living as well, maybe on a lesson scale. She said, I was living a paradox of conditional self-love. If I got enough likes, if I got enough likes, if I got enough hits, if I got more followers, then maybe I'll love myself. But then on the other side, there was a constant self-hate. Constant. 
How? You had so many fans. You had so many followers. You had it made. How could you possibly hate yourself? It goes back to what we said last week. It goes back to what we said last week. We said this. Hey, no matter how real you think you are on social media, I'm speaking to myself. I'm speaking to the adults in the room. I'm speaking to the leaders in the room. No matter how real you think you are on social media, there will always, it's always filtered. There's always, there's always a filter. And so even if you're loved and accepted and approved on social media, you know You know that they're loving and accepting and approving of a filtered version of you. And you desire so much more than being being loved for somebody that you're not. You desire to be loved and seen for who you are. But social media makes that nearly impossible. The approval that you get online is just approval of the highlighted parts of you. Next slide. The approval that you get online is just approval of the highlighted parts of you. It's just something to think about. And I think we live in this paradox. And I think we all know this. This is why we look at our phones every two seconds after we post a picture to see who's liking it. That This is why maybe, just maybe, let's get real in here, you've sent inappropriate pictures to people of the opposite sex because you want to be accepted or approved. You're like, I don't feel right about this. But you do it because you're searching for acceptance and approval from this. This is why maybe you compare yourself to people and again, you fall into maybe some self-hate because of the lack of attention or whatever it is. This is always going to leave you wanting more. It is. The approval you get on social media and your phone and all these different things, it's always going to leave you wanting more. And now we're going to go into kind of a different aspect of this approval thing and this confidence thing. God wants more for you. In fact, I would go as far as to say this. God doesn't approve of you seeking approval from people. He doesn't. While the cross shouts to you that you're accepted and approved before God, if you believe in Jesus as Lord and Savior, you're accepted, you're approved, but there are some things that God does not approve of in your life and in mine. Proverb writer makes it really clear. Hey, the approval of man, it proves to be a trap every time, makes you do really stupid stuff. The apostle Paul goes as far as to say this. You think I'm trying to please people? I think I'm trying to win the approval of man. If I was, I wouldn't be a servant of Christ. That's strong language. So I don't think God approves of you seeking your approval from people. And I think maybe there's two reasons why, probably more, but we're just going to talk about two. First one's this. While man's approval comes from what you project, what you put out there, God's approval oftentimes comes from what is done in private. This is something to think about. Maybe this is good for the leaders, the parents to hear. Like, you know what God approves of? God says he loves, he loves when you go into your closet, just pray by yourself. He loves that. He loves when you're at school and nobody's looking and you aren't trying to gain anything from it and you go love someone who who might be outcasted, maybe gets bullied or whatever it is or sits alone at lunch. He loves that. He loves loves a heart that is pure. Hands that are clean, clean before him. In fact, oftentimes in scripture, we're led to believe that what God approves of in our lives and what we do, it kind of comes down to motive. Why are we doing it? Why are we doing what we're doing? Look at what Jesus says in Matthew chapter six, beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. And then this is really strong language. This is something that I think we all have to wrestle with For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. What if that's true? What if, and this might sound a little legalistic, but just let's try and use some real life examples. What if when you post your, and this is me too, this is all of us, and I'm not even saying, we'll get to it, I'm not even going to explain myself. Let's Let's say you post a quiet time on your social media and your story. And you do it so that people know how spiritual you are. What if in that moment, the only reward you'll get are the likes and the attention from the picture? 
What if when you share your good deed and what you did for the world to see on Facebook, hey, listen to me, look what I did, this was so great, I'm so kind, I'm so spiritual. What if in that moment, the only reward you're, you'll get is the attention you get on social media? It's just something to think about. And I'm not saying you can't post a Bible verse, you probably should. I wrestle with it all the time. I'm not saying you can't post a quiet time, you, there's probably times for that. I'm not saying you can't post this stuff, but I am saying if this is true, hear me on this, we at least have to ask this question. And even if, it, even if it's unrelated to this whole approval thing and you're like, I don't really care about being sick, whatever. Let's just ask this question together before we post anything. Why am I posting this? Why, why am I posting this? We can throw that slide up there. Why? What's the, what's the reason? Why am, I, why am I posting this? And I think oftentimes as we ask that question, maybe just maybe some other motives will come to light and we'll realize maybe I don't need to. Or if your motives are pure, good, clean, post it. Put it out there. But if you're posting to be approved of by others, God doesn't approve of that. I believe that. Second, Second reason maybe God doesn't love for us to s search for approval from people is this. If we're seeking approval from people, we're essentially saying that God's approval isn't enough. Like if we're hungry, if we're thirsty for approval from people, just posts and stuff, I need it, I need it, I need it, I need it, I need it. What's that say about our confidence and security in the approval that God says we have? I love what one pastor says. He says, in a relationship with Jesus, our confidence should be rock solid. Man's disapproval shouldn't have the power to break us, and man's approval shouldn't have the power to satisfy us. Hear me on this. You are loved, you're cared for, you're valued, you're cherished, and you so badly want to say that is enough. The praise, I'll take it or leave it. But, but I know, I know, I know what my heavenly father says about me. Jesus came for you. He lived a perfect, sinless life. He died a brutal death. He rose victorious over your sin. And the moment that you believe in him, he says you're accepted and approved. He looks at you. He sees all the sin he sees all the junk. He sees all the things that you're ashamed of. And he says, I love you anyways. That's the only type of love that will ever satisfy you. It's the only thing that will ever bring about a confidence and security in your life. And so hear me on this. I'm not saying this to come down on you. I'm saying this because I love you. Here we go. Hear me, God. Hear me on this. Dudes, we wrestle with this. Girls, we wrestle with this. Listen, if your social media life if a lot of your phone revolves around gaining approval from people, just talk about maybe some changes that need to be made. Think about changing this whole thing. Think about it. Think about exchanging the approval of man for the approval that is rock solid that I have in Christ. I love what, I love what, one author says, if, if you trade the approval of God for the approval of people, it's a horrible trade. You lose something great, and honestly, you gain something pitiful. What do you gain? You gain the praise of man. You want it. You get it. It's like a drug. It gives a buzz, and then it's done. You've got to get another fix, and it leaves you always insecure. You were always needy of other people's praise in order to be happy or to feel secure. You were never satisfied. It's just something to think about. The next thing that I think we forfeit <clears throat> on the altar of our phones is holiness. Holiness. Hear me on this. You desire to be like Jesus. You desire to be like Jesus. We can throw that up on the screen, my friend. Love you. You desire to be like Jesus. God desires for you to be like Jesus. I believe that. Like, your heavenly Father desires for you to become more and more like Christ. This is, this is holiness. You, you, your sin level kind of begins to be minimized. Doesn't mean you don't struggle. 
but your righteousness begins to kind of flourish and become greater. You, you desire in your life to not only be forgiven of your sin, but to be freed from it, to be freed from the power of it over your life. You desire to live victorious, alive in Christ, the life that God has made you to live, made for you to live. But I think at times, at least the way that we use our phones, okay, we're robbed of that holiness in a sense. We can put it this way. Our phones tend to make us feel as if our sin is secret and anonymous and no one will ever find out. There are certain things, let's be real, where in, in your life, in our lives, some of the social comparing you have, and it doesn't mean that it's just one thing that you're probably thinking of right now. I'm going to get to it in a second. But it could be comparing yourself to people. It can be being envious of other people, jealousy, anger, frustration. Again, self-hate type stuff where you devalue people and yourself it can be all that. But also pornography. It's at your fingertips. Let's be honest. I'm not going to be naive to it. It's at your fingertips. The scrolling on social media platforms and looking at girls and guys lustfully. It's right there. It's right there. And you desire so bad for it not to be. Whether you feel it or not, you desire to be like Jesus. You desire to overcome the things that you have, but you say no one's ever going to find out about it. And eventually, maybe I'll stop. Eventually, maybe I'll stop. But until then, I'll just fake it. I'll fake it. I'll fake it. I'll fake it. And even if I don't stop, nobody's ever going to know. And I'm not trying to get all spooky, okay? But I am going to say something that I think you guys already know. In the kingdom of God, nothing is hidden. In the kingdom of God, nothing is hidden. And I'm not saying that to make you feel ashamed. I'm not saying that to make you feel guilty. I'm just saying something that is very, very obvious that oftentimes we forget. We forgot it in the garden, Adam and Eve. And it's this, God sees everything. He, he, know, he knows what you're doing. He, he knows what I'm doing. I'm not fooling anybody. You're not fooling anybody. Or maybe the problem is we are fooling people, but we aren't fooling God. Okay, so now what do you, now, and we're going to talk more about some of the sexual stuff in our Love, Sex, and Dating series in February, but some of you are thinking, okay, so what's the message tonight? Just stop doing this? Like seriously, do you have any hidden vices on your phone? Maybe any struggles, sin that nobody else knows about? that's brought about because of this? And maybe you're thinking, wait, so the message is just stop? Stop doing it? No, that's not the message because there's a deeper issue here if we're doing some of this stuff and if we have hidden vices. And the issue is this, your online behavior simply reveals and exposes what's in our hearts. This is a hard issue. Every sin issue is a hard issue. So like, if I just said, hey, you gotta stop this tonight, stop it, okay? If we don't work on what's going on on the inside, no, nothing's gonna happen, okay? Like, your desire for holiness isn't fulfilled by simply resolving to behave better. It doesn't work. It doesn't. So, let's keep going with this thought process. If you wanna change your behavior, student, you have to change your affections, we could say it this way, the root of your holiness, the root of you becoming more like Jesus, living the life that you're called to live, isn't found necessarily in what you do, but what you love most. And for many of us, for many of us, let's just be honest, the apps, the pictures, the websites that maybe we shouldn't be going to, the, the approval, the buzz that we get from all the likes and the pictures that we send to people, whatever it is, if we're being honest, at least our lives would reflect that we love this more than we love God. For many of us, if we're being honest, 
our life on here would reflect at least the idea and the thought, I'm not saying it's true, but let's just wrestle with it, that we love this stuff more than we love the Jesus who came, lived, died for us. So if that's the case, maybe holiness doesn't begin with a change of behavior. Maybe it begins with a change of focus. Maybe it begins with a change of focus. What are you, what are you paying attention to? What are you thinking about? What are you letting in? Because what you let in, what you let into your heart and into your mind eventually comes out. It comes out in the way that you speak and the way that you think about people and the way that you are on your phones, all these different things. What are you letting in? What are you focused on? What are you thinking about? What are your eyes seeing? What are your ears hearing? These messages that the Apostle Paul gives, they're so countercultural. He says this in Colossians 3, 1, 2. Since then you've been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on this, not on earthly things. You got to get your eyes off of this. 2 Corinthians 4.18, Paul says this, so we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. It lasts forever. This stuff pales in comparison to the things of God. 1 Peter, Peter says this, therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming, when Jesus comes back. Do we ever think about that? Do we ever wrestle with thoughts like that? We got to wrestle with this stuff. We can skip that next slide. I don't know why I put that one up there. But what are you focused on? What are you What are you thinking about? And let's be honest. This makes it really hard to focus on the things that Jesus wants us to focus on. This is what we behold. This is what we look at. But what Scripture teaches all throughout the narrative is that what we behold, we become. What we behold, we become. Our life, who we are becoming, I think that's the slide, who we are becoming Who we are becoming kind of follows suit with what we are beholding, with what we are looking at. So we could say it this way, and this seems big and huge, and it is. Something's changing you. Something's transforming you. You're being impacted. You're being changed. You're being influenced by something all the time, by what you let in, by what you look at, by what you think about, by what you hear. Something's changing you. And the question is this, will it be your phone or will it be Jesus? (laughs) Right? What's it, what's it going to be? I think there's a choice. I think there's a choice we have. And I know what some of you are saying well, can it be both? Can't, can it be both? Like, can't we express a God-given confidence and holiness on our phones? Can it be both? Can I, can I be impacted by Christ, my Lord and my Savior, and not be afraid of my phone? I'm not telling you to be afraid of your phone. I'm telling you to wrestle with this. I'm telling you to think about it. And here's my answer to that question I think so. I think. I think it can be both. I think, I think we can be impacted by Jesus and still be on our phone and all these. I, th- I, think these, I think this and God can work together. I think God can use this. I do. I'm still wrestling with how. In my life, at least. I'm still wrestling, to be honest with you, if I sat down and said, hey, middle schooler, this is how we're going to use our phone for good. You're going to be on it. You're going to go all in. I'm still wrestling with all that. That's why we're going to talk about it next week. But in the meantime, in the meantime, hear me, hear me on this. Just, just do our John reading plan. Just, just do all that you can to just focus on Jesus, to just think on him, to reflect on him to obsess over him, 
It's John 7 today. It's cool. Jesus is at a feast, at a big old party. Has some cool conversations. Tomorrow's John 8. Great passage of scripture that points us to heavenly things, things that are unseen, things that are beyond us. Make that your pursuit. Make that your priority. And then next week, come back. We're going to have a conversation with some other people as well, some other leaders, and we're just going to talk about it. We're just going to think about it. I want you guys to be engaged with our Instagram this week. I'm going to be asking some questions, what you guys think about this stuff. And honestly, you guys could probably inform me just as much as I could inform you. So we're just going on this journey together, and I think it's an important one. And so I hope you come back next week, and I hope you bring some friends with you. With that said, we're going to sing a really good song after I pray. It's a new one again. It's a new one. It's a really good one. We heard it at Passion Conference. Anybody go to Passion? Yes, we had some people go to Passion. It was really good. Um, I'm going to pray for us, and then we're going to go to God in worship. <clears throat> Father, you're worthy of our attention. You're worthy of all praise and honor and glory and power, not just when we get to heaven, but right here and right now. And Father, our phones aren't bad. They're not. My phone's really good. I love it. I love the ESPN app. I like Instagram. Facebook's fun sometimes. But Father, for me at least, sometimes I just love it too much. Sometimes I just think about it all the time. Sometimes my eyes are fixed on it much more than they're fixed on you and things that are much more important than what's going on behind this little screen. And God, maybe someone in the room can relate. Maybe almost everyone in the room can relate. God, I pray maybe more than anything that you would just make yourself so good and so big and so holy and so incomparable to anything that we fix our eyes on and think on. Father, I pray that as we give you just a little bit of our attention or maybe hopefully a lot of our attention, you could just blow up in our minds, in my mind, I need that in our leaders' minds, in the parents' minds, in the middle schoolers' minds, in the high schoolers' minds, where we say, look, this other stuff, it's just no rival to you. It doesn't compare to you. And we're never going to get this thing perfect. But God, I pray that we can get better. I pray that you can help us because a lot hangs in the balance. I think our purpose and our meaning and these God-given desires that you've placed on our hearts hang in the balance. And the only way that these desires are going to be fulfilled is if we give you all the praise and the honor and the glory that you deserve. If we acknowledge that you are God and you are God alone and we are going to praise you and you alone because of it. God, we love you. And it's in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen, amen. Let's stand up and let's sing this last song together.